we truly are going to have nothing holding us back from our Lord and Savior Jesus. We need to come to him and lay down our sin before him, that he might wipe it away so that we have full access to him and our loving heavenly father. Tonight, I'm going to ask that you uh, confess your sins along with me with the words that I'm going to pray on our behalf here in your hearts and your minds. So confess with me as we go before our Lord. Lord Jesus, my sin runs both deep and wide beyond what I would like to admit. Like Judas, I too have betrayed you with the things I have done and said, Lord, but also the things I have failed to do and to say. I have no excuse before you, Lord. All I can do is cry out to you, God, Have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus, he hears your cry for mercy. And in his great love, that love that led him to sacrifice himself on the cross for you, in his great love, he is eager and willing to forgive you of all of your sins. And so it is my privilege to stand here before you as a called and ordained servant of our Lord and to declare to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you that you have taken it all away, Lord. That through your suffering and death, you took our sin upon yourself. That even though we turn away from you, Lord, though we deny and betray you, Lord, you will never turn away or deny us. You continue to chase after us, Lord, calling us back to yourself, an amazing and unending love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. Empower us, Lord, to love you in return and to love others with that same love with which you have loved us. And Lord Jesus, we pray that prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Congregation, you may be seated at this time. And uh, our kids, I believe at this time, you are dismissed at uh, kids' time. And we now enter into this time in our service where we can give back to our Lord uh, what he has already given us, an act of love to him as we worship the Lord with the giving of our offerings. Jesus loves the sinner 
who but Jesus calls him friend reaches out to touch the leper bids the weary come to him who but Jesus loves the lonely those the world has cast outside and with such makes a wretch his chosen bride. Who but Jesus dwells among us, called this broken world his home, took on flesh and pain and sorrow, reaping what he did not sow. One of the twelve went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, 
One of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. They were saddened. And one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied. One who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. Yes. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Pray with me. Jesus, as we meditate tonight on your words, open our hearts, teach us what we have failed to see up until tonight. Teach us, Lord, uh, your will for our lives. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat> so we are continuing on this journey with the devotional, reliving the passion. Now we're, we're not uh, preaching about the devotional, but we're following along and I hope you're getting a lot out of it. I know I sure am. But even though we're looking at the devotional, what we're really doing here is we are looking intently at the last three chapters of the Gospel of Mark throughout this entire season. Which what it really means there is we are looking at the final days of the life of Jesus Christ and what they meant to the world then, what they mean to the world now, and what they mean to us. Today we come to this passage of Jesus predicting the betrayal of one disciple and the defection of all the disciples. So what can we learn from this little section of Scripture? I think, first of all, we, it's important for us to realize that, that this section is especially addressed to people who considered themselves close to Jesus. People who think of themselves as the friends of Christ. People who would call themselves followers and leaders in this Christian church. And three things I want you to take away tonight with you. First of all, the breadth of sin. Secondly, the depth of sin. And the last thing we're going to talk about is how to overcome sin. So let's begin with the breadth of sin. Jesus is there in the upper room celebrating the Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper is what they called it. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. You see, here Jesus is telling his disciples that he is offering his body. He is pouring out his blood for the sins of the world. And he uses this moment as a lead up to talk to them about their own failures. We didn't see it in the clip, but the verse uh, immediately after this happens, he says to all of the disciples, you will all fall away. So why does Jesus 
tie his death to their failure. In placing the Lord's Supper between Judas's betrayal and the disciples' defection, the gospel of Mark is making very clear to all of us that the sin that makes Jesus' death necessary is not someone else's sin. Someone like Caesar or Pharaoh or evil tyrants that spring up around the world from time to time. Mark is making clear to all of us that the sin that makes the death of Jesus necessary is the sin of the disciples themselves. Peter and John, Judas and you and me. Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the problem of the world's evil and sin is brought to the table. And we are the ones who are bringing it. The Russian novelist and critic of communism, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he said this, he said, the, dividing, the line dividing good from evil goes right down the center of every human heart. When it comes to knowing your own heart, it's not enough for us to say, what have I done? We must also ask ourselves this question, what am I capable of doing? If I were under certain pressures or facing certain threats, or if I had certain opportunities that I've never experienced before, would I be capable of producing great evil under certain conditions? And the Bible says, why, yes, you would. And so would I. Over a century ago, the London Times asked a whole bunch of prominent writers uh, to produce an essay for the paper. And what they wanted to know was, what is wrong with the world? And the Christian author, G.K. Chesterton, wrote them this very simple reply. He said, dear sirs, I am, sincerely, G.K. Chesterton, I am what's wrong with the world. He understood that the sin that is dividing the hearts of all men and women, uh, and some of you might be thinking that, yes, pastor, I've been a Lutheran for a long time. We all know that we're all a bunch of sinners. Tell me something I don't know. I am, my friends. You see, if we really knew this, we would be able to solve two of humanity's most intractable problems. The first problem is this. We have a hard time forgiving other people, amen? Come on. We've been doing this for a while now, come on. One prominent psychologist said that one third of his patients would be cured if they would only learn how to forgive. One third. You see, the inability to get past the anger of what you perceive as a slight, what other people did to you, and maybe it's more than a perception. Maybe they really did do something bad to you. But the inability to deal with that anger leads you to a life of bitterness, self-pity, and resentment. You are controlled by your anger in life. So how can you get free? Think about this. If somebody lies to you, how do you feel about them? You're a liar, right? You are a dirty little liar. And then you make a caricature of them in your heart. Their, their faults get exaggerated and all the good things about them are minuscule compared to the fact that they are a liar. But what happens when you lie? Well, that's complicated, isn't it? 
I mean, under the circumstances, I don't know what other choice I had. I mean, I had some very good reasons. This is really one of those gray areas. Life is not so black and white when I lie. Amen? And why does this happen? I'll tell you. Because we refuse to put ourselves in the same class as the other person. Christian author Miroslav Volf writes, Forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans and myself from the community of sinners. If you find it impossible for yourself to forgive somebody, then you don't really believe in the universality of sin. Not really. You see, my friends, we are all the same. I'm not quite as complex as I like to think I am, and you are not as one-dimensional and inhuman as I like to think you are when I'm mad at you. We are in the community of sinners, all of us together. And if you truly believe this, then you will forgive every grudge that you've been carrying And the very cool thing is a great many of your problems will get sorted out in a relatively small period of time. Now, the second of these intractable human problems that we all face is this. We disdain groups. I mean, just look at the world. So many of us have one or two groups of people that we just can't stand, amen? Now, we're trying really hard these days to make sure that those groups that we don't like aren't based on race or gender or anything really bad like that. But we are happy to disdain people based on ideology and politics. Am I right? We can't stand them because they're what's wrong with this world. We've cured racism and chauvinism with groupism. But that's really no cure at all, is it? You see, if you believe in the universal nature of sin, then you must also believe in the radical nature of grace. If we are saved by grace and Christians say that this is what they believe, then it is not because our doctrine is so pure that we're going to get anything from God. It is not because our practice is so pleasing that we deserve anything. We are all, all of us, saved by the sheer mercy and grace of our God. Pastor Timothy Keller says that, Becoming a Christian or or growing as a Christian feels like it's a struggle and we're making a choice and we're doing all of this hard work. But it's finally like walking through the door of faith. faith. You made it this far and, and it feels like you had to really work for it. But then you look back behind you and you see above the door a sign that says, I chose you. You did not choose me. You see, the only reason that any of us believe is because the hound of heaven chased us down and conquered our hard hearts with his grace. And now if this is true in your heart and mind, if you truly believe in this grace, then it rehumanizes the people that you look down on. If we really believed in the universality of sin and the radical nature of grace, we wouldn't despise any group or class or political party or race. You see, grace rehumanizes everyone. Because that old saying is true, my friend. Say it with me. There, but for the grace of God, go I. Isn't that right? That's the breadth of sin. 
It's everybody's problem. And we are all quite capable of doing the things that we condemn other people for doing. So now let's look at the depth of sin. To truly know yourself, you gotta get beneath the surface. We gotta start looking at our motives. As we are growing as Christians, we start to do good things and we give up doing some of the bad things we were doing. And on the surface, it looks like you are changing for the better. And you are. And you start to feel pretty good about it. And you should. But the depth of sin question is this. Why are you doing all of these good things? And Jesus helps us think about this in in verse 18. He says, while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. So why in the world is Jesus being so ambiguous about who the betrayer is? Well, I believe it's because Jesus wants all of his disciples to search their hearts that night and this night. The word that Jesus uses for betray here literally means to sell. The sin of betrayal is this. You're going to serve me as long as it benefits you, but you will sell me out the minute it costs you more than you are willing to comfortably pay. So let's say you got two people and they are both doing the good things that Jesus invites us to do, but one of them is doing it to profit themselves while the other is doing it only to please the Lord. They look the same, but the motive is different. And the only way to discover the difference, and you're not going to like this one, the only way to know what motive is driving you is when things go bad. And for the disciples, things are about to go very, very bad. Up until now, it looked like Jesus was going to come conquering in and the kingdom was going to come and these guys were going to get to be bigwigs in this new kingdom. But now things have turned. And he says to them, one of us has sold him out. And I find it very interesting that none of them flat out denies it. They say this, they say, surely not I, question mark, as if they didn't even know their own hearts, as if they were suspecting of themselves, they might be willing to turn him in. They didn't say, surely not I, exclamation point. See, what the Bible says to you and to me, what it wants us to see is that we may not be a Judas through and through, but we've all got a little bit of Judas in us, amen? Every time we go through something bad or hard or difficult in life, we are faced with a temptation to betray God. We find out in those bad spots, if we are in this relationship with Jesus to serve him, or if we're in it for him to serve us. And there's no way to know which of those things it is really deep down inside until bad things happen. And when those bad things happen, that little Judas part of your heart says, hey, where is the blessing that I signed up for? Why am I doing all of these good things if this is all I'm gonna get for it? The Judas part of you believes that if I obey and do good, God is gonna owe me. But the gospel says, God has given me everything by grace. He saved me from sin and from myself by his grace. Therefore, I just, I serve him out of gratitude and love because he doesn't owe me anything, but I owe him 
everything. There's a little Judas in all of us, but there's also a little Mary. Remember the sermon from Sunday? Right before we see this supper happening, this last supper in Mark, we saw another party. We saw a great feast thrown, a resurrection party for for Mary's brother Lazarus being raised from the dead. And so Mary grabs her perfume, her whole life savings, and she pours it out on the head and the feet of Jesus. And she did it all out of nothing but pure, extravagant love in response to the love and mercy that Jesus had shown to her family. Do you see the difference between Judas and Mary? Judas found Jesus useful, but Mary found Jesus beautiful. Do you understand the difference between useful and beautiful? When I was in college, I went to quite a few musical theater productions. I did it because if I wrote one simple one-page review of this, I was assured to get an A in this class. And so I went to the productions, and I got my A. Going to musical theater was very useful to me. Now, over the past decade of my life, my children have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours practicing and performing in musical theater shows. Hundreds of hours singing songs in my car and in my house. (laughs) But, and don't tell my wife, I've got to admit, I am filled with delight every time I watch them perform and every time I see them watching other people perform and I see how excited they are. Today, I am willing to spend great amounts of time and hundreds of my hard-earned dollars going to musical theater performances because it has become beautiful to me. Over Christmas break, we saw the musical as a family, The Greatest Showman about P.T. Barnum. Anybody seen that one? And as I watched it, tears flowed down from my eyes. And my friends, I don't cry about anything, but it was beautiful to me. I am a sucker for a redemption story and a power ballad. The beauty of of Jesus moved Mary to pour out her greatest treasure and experience the joy of generosity. Mary served Jesus just because of the shining magnificence of who he is. If you serve Jesus because he's useful like Judas, My friends, you are going to ride the wave of circumstances in your life. You're going to be happy when things are going good, and you're going to be miserable when you think the circumstances are going bad. But a gospel person like Mary thinks of Jesus as an end unto himself. So their obedience is pure joy. And your emotions aren't on this roller coaster all the time because you are transfixed by his beauty. And he never changes. Well, that all sounds really nice, Pastor Eric. But how? How do I see Jesus as beautiful and not just useful? Let's go back to 18 one more time. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. See, Jesus just leans back at the table and he drops this little bomb in the middle of his disciples. Now I did say that he was being ambiguous because he wanted all of his disciples to search themselves. But another thing is happening here. You see, he is also saying to Judas, I see you. Jesus is trying to warn Judas. 
He wants him to see that if he goes through with this betrayal, it would be better for him to have not even been born. He warns him, but he doesn't expose him. Why? I believe that this is Jesus' final act of courtesy and love towards Judas. Jesus wants Judas to repent and not throw his eternal life away. He wants to convict him. He doesn't want to condemn him. You see, if he had trampled Judas, Judas would have immediately hardened his heart and thought to himself, see, I knew Jesus was a fraud. Jesus doesn't want to trample his heart. He wants to melt it instead. Oh, the perfect gentleness of Jesus. He loves him enough to confront him. Jesus is not an enabler, my friends. He believes in confrontation. He believes that love demands it. He confronts him, but he doesn't smash him. He doesn't embarrass him publicly. He doesn't grumble about him behind his back to his friends. He doesn't want to ruin his opportunity to bring Judas to repentance. Behold the gentle beauty of Jesus. A beauty that he unveils on sinners, even sinners like Judas and Mary and the disciples and you and me and the whole world. Here in Jerusalem, at the Last Supper, he says to this ragged band of sinners, my body and my blood is given in exchange for your sin-filled lives. My beauty in just a few hours will be offered in exchange for all of your ugliness on a cold, hard, rugged cross. If Jesus can offer that beauty to Judas, who was about to betray him, then my friends, you better believe he most certainly can offer that beauty to you and to me. Don't respond like Judas and sell Jesus out when he no longer appears to be useful. Respond to him like Mary and lose yourself in the gentle beauty of your Savior. Amen. Let's stand on our feet. I hope you know how much Jesus loves you. I hope you feel it. I hope you let it sink all the way in. Open your hearts, my friends, to receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with kindness and love and give to you his peace. Amen. Let's sing one more time. Friends, it was great to be here and worship with you here tonight. Go in peace and serve the Lord.